Hello, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Welcome to our community. Uh, today, we're going to talk about another immunotherapy called donanumab. Um, it is an Eli Lilly drug that is currently under clinical three trials. Um, there's been a lot of news lately about Aduhelm, um, which, as we know, was approved by the FDA not long ago. Um, this is a similar drug in the sense that it is um, an, an immunotherapy which uses, employs our immune system to fight um, beta amyloid plaque in the brain. So I'm really pl pleased to have Dr. David Weidman. He is with the Banner Alzheimer's Institute and he is a principal investigator of donanumab. Welcome, Dr. Weidman. Yeah, thanks, Deborah. Okay, let's just really kind of clarify here. I mean, um, uh, donanumab is an immunotherapy. Is it going after the same thing as Aduhelm, um, which is the beta amyloid plaque in our brain? Yes, they're both MABs, you know, which is an acronym for monoclonal antibodies. And they both uh, target uh, parts of this fibular or solidified or insoluble amyloid plaque in the cortex of the brain. I like to liken that uh, to uh, if you leave uh, bread in the uh, toaster too long, well, then the cortex or the uh, outside of the bread gets crusty. And that's what essentially amyloid plaque will do. It collects between the cells, but uh, aducanumab now branded as adjuhelm and then uh, target different parts of this fibular solid amyloid in our cerebral cortex or surface of the brain. But the uh, idea is to lower the amount throughout the cortex by giving it roughly once a month intravenously as an infusion. So is it fair to say that um, in principle, they're the same drug, but um, aiming at different biomarkers? Can we say that? No, they're, well, they're both aiming at the biomarker of cortical amyloid plaque, one could enter these trials by having strubospinal fluid show that the person is what's called amyloid positive or has elevated amyloid in the cortex, ironically, by lower amounts of soluble amyloid in the spinal fluid. Don't want to get too technical, but to answer the question, uh, they are, uh, Donam is, is a very, attacks a very specific part of the protein along an amino acid chain called N3PG, which is an epitope, and it'll get too technical to understand antibodies and antigens. Whereas, believe it or not, aducanumab is fully humanized. It was derived from antibodies made by very elderly folks who didn't get Alzheimer's. So if you can imagine 15, 20 years ago, someone had the bright idea of actually, uh, uh, through all of the genetic engineering, amplify uh, actual antibodies made by elderly folks that were cognitively resilient. And uh, whereas donanumab is not fully humanized, but humanized, meaning it was originally uh, tested and synthesized uh, in, you know, in animals. And then it's modified so that the human body doesn't really create an allergy uh, when exposed to it. Uh, and so there's some modifications of the actual antibody to make it look more human. And that's what we call humanized maps. Okay. And so I just want to take a little bit of a, a step back to provide context um, to people. Immunotherapies have been successful in treating some, some types of cancer. This is really the first time they're being used on neurodegeneration. Is that correct? Uh, in respect to Alzheimer's. Yes, we've tested them in later stages uh, and the different type of antibodies, some attack the soluble forms of the amyloid, but testing the amyloid hypothesis and giving anti-amyloid treatments, be it antibodies, be it enzyme inhibitors, uh, has been going, go the investigations and trials date back over, over 20 years, close to okay. 20. So we're seeing the doors open slightly or hopefully wide, um, which yeah. it really depends on a lot. Of, we need a lot more data to really understand this. Um, but just to be really clear, these drugs are hoping to really like slow down the process, uh, the progression of Alzheimer's. They're not really considered a cure, are they? No, not a cure. And in fact, we'll get into this later. 
uh, there is actually very transparent communication from, uh, from Lilly, it's an Alzheimer's forum, that anti-amyloid therapy in the earliest symptomatic stages of Alzheimer's can only go so far to slow down decline about 30, 35%. So it's a huge start. Uh, and uh, it's really generated enthusiasm as of course has Adjuhelm, but it does not improve day-to-day -day symptoms. An individual patient is gonna have to have these infusions uh, on faith that it will slow down decline. But again, it's a group to group, big group of people getting the drug, big group getting the placebo. And it's certainly not a cure, in fact, the Alzheimer's field really doesn't have trials to halt or reverse gears. We're, we're, our first goal in disease modification, and of course it's a big hurdle uh, before we get to those subsequently in the future, would be to slow down cognitive and functional decline. But actually, even though Adjahelm has been approved, we actually don't know if that happens, right? We don't know if, like we know that these drugs reduce the amount of plaque in the brain, but we don't actually understand what that means in relation to the progression of Alzheimer's. That is correct. There is increasing research, even within these trials, to understand whether or not, if given early enough, these anti-amyloid therapies lowering the cortical amyloid will somehow then lead to slower accumulation of the other protein, uh, that defines Alzheimer's disease, the, the tangles which are inside the cells because cell death and loss of synapses with a further accumulation of the tower tangles is much more, clo is much more closely associated with symptoms. The amyloid plaques start collecting 10 and in genetic cases, sometimes 15 to 20 years before symptoms even begin. Yeah, and there's that perennial question is, you know, how bad is the actual plaque, right? I mean, we know it's we don't know if it's a cause That's of Alzheimer's. For sure. Absolutely true. It, yeah. it, it's, it's the hallmark, uh, one of the two hallmarks that define Alzheimer's. So we don't want to expose folks to anti-amyloid therapy if they don't have elevated amyloid in the uh, surface or cortex of the brain. But we don't know if that initiates the cascade. It is a hypothesis and there are some competing uh, hypotheses. How far away are we, um, Dr. Weidman, from understanding if immunotherapy can give us more clues about or reduce um, tau tangles in our brain? Yeah, so even within the denanumab trial, which was phase two, uh, although small numbers, there is some evidence that in specific regions of the brain where the tau uh, seems to collect uh, in a greater fashion because it seems to propagate along a certain pathway, uh, mainly the temporal lobes, that there is some slowing down of accumulation of that tangled burden or tau burden uh, in the treatment group. So that's also fairly exciting. And uh, uh, it does lend credence to the fact that there can be some disease modification from anti-amyloid antibodies. And uh, I'd remind that the denanumab trial was really the first phase two trial Adjahelm or Adjacanimus phase three studies, phase two a little smaller, but it was the first phase two trial to meet a clinical endpoint, which is you know above board and published in the New England Journal of Medicine in, in, in March of this year. And that of course generated some excitement and uh, a transition of this, uh, a trial of a second trial of this drug transitioning to phase three or much larger numbers based on some encouraging findings from the phase two. So when you said that there's like a, a, a bit of uh, promising data about tau, um, how, what type of numbers are we talking about? We're talking small, maybe 40 or 50 patients uh, opted in. It was probably an optional study to look at the tau or tangle burden in, in the first study. Uh, but it was a requirement of the denanumab trial to have a sweet spot or Goldilocks amount of tau in order to qualify. Too much, too much tau means too much cell death. Chances are too late for anti-amyloid therapy. Too little, actually it'd be a good time to give it, but just within the 78 weeks, you wouldn't maybe see a signal or a difference between treatment and placebo because no one would actually significantly progress on the primary endpoints, which are functional and cognitive scales. So they created a nice sweet spot. Uh, and uh, I think that 
we're going to know a lot more about uh, this drug and its action in the phase three because in that uh, they allowed in those with a heavier tangle burden, uh, not just the low to medium group or the sweet spot, but actually heavier amount uh, to see if that group in any way uh, shows a, so, a slowing of cognitive decline. So can we assume that if people have a heavier burden of tau, they're in a later stage of dementia? Is that fair to say? Yes, very fair. Um, in fact, uh, I'm working on a PowerPoint right now that clearly uh, the amount of tangle or tau deposition is not only more closely associated with symptoms, but helps define what stage one is in within the whole continuum. Remember, it's a continuous process. Uh, we, for arbitrary reasons, we say cognitively unimpaired, mild cognitive impairment, and then mild stage of Alzheimer's, then moderate and severe, and so on. But they're really not discrete entities. It's a continuous process. And along the way, we can see that the amount of tau uh, actually will tell you what stage they might be with, in within the mild cognitive impairment you know, phase. So we might have a better way to refine, are you in early mild cognitive impairment or is the patient uh, uh, in a late mild cognitive impairment? Are they about to lose their independence? Uh, or do they already have mild stage Alzheimer's? And uh, uh, off the record, I can uh, sometimes get a sense that the tau pet is uh, while closely associated with stage, it's not perfect. Uh, ultimately, loss of nerve cells have to lead to loss of connections among the nerve cells, and that's called synaptic loss. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I, I hate to keep comparing Adjuhelm, but that's our only comparison, so I have, to, right. and it's been in the news um, constantly, and being patient has been covering it. Um, I one of the the problem with the FDA labeling we know um you know when Adjuhelm came out they first said Alzheimer's disease and that set a lot of alarm bells off with certain people feeling like it's only been tested on early stage like right. you know denanimab um so I'm curious and as somebody who has a mom with Alzheimer's disease who's you know probably in a later stage um I want to know, are any of these drugs going to shed light on whether or not we could help people who are in a later stage of Alzheimer's, or is it really just geared towards people who are just yeah. entering this process? Well, I can answer it this way. This was the original package insert or labeling that it would just be indicated for Alzheimer's disease, and that came out on June 7th. Weeks later, no more than two weeks ago, the FDA mandated that the label specify that the drug is only indicated for those with mild cognitive impairment and mild Alzheimer's disease, not moderate or moderately severe stages. So uh, uh, your question is uh, somewhat obsolete now because we, uh, everyone in, in arms just demanded that the package insert really try to follow along with the patient population that participated in the trials, which was only mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease and uh, early mild or prodromal Alzheimer's. Right, okay, we're getting some questions in that I wanna address. Sure. Um, a member of our audience is asking if these therapies help patients um, with suspected CTE um, and um, in particular anger problems related to CTE. Well, CTE is uh, actually not an amyloidogenic process. In the deep little valleys of the spaces in your brain, they take the most hits during a concussion when your brain moves back and forth. And what collects on the bottom there are little tau deposits. A little bit different, but not a whole lot different from the tau that develops in Alzheimer's disease so no, these anti-amyloid therapies wouldn't be appropriate to even test in a CTE patient. So what about other types of dementia? Um, is it relevant um, you know, with other types of dementia where, where plaque presents itself in an earlier stage? That is a great question. It hasn't been studied, but there is an overlap, uh, especially elderly folks can have a mix of, of two or more neurodegenerative disorders the most common one that's associated also with formation of amyloid is dementia with Lewy bodies. So they form amyloid and Lewy bodies. 
And what I uh, explained to families is that Alzheimer's is like the sun and then Lewy body's little moon. And if you picture a Venn diagram or an overlap, you could see that most people with Alzheimer's don't have Lewy bodies, but many persons with Lewy body disease or dementia Lewy bodies also have Alzheimer's process ongoing as an overlap. They tend to have both disorders about 50 to 60% of the time. So that is theoretically possible. Has it been studied? Not, not that I know of for dementia with Lewy bodies, because the, the main protein that collects called alpha synuclein would really be the disease, uh, the, the protein to attack in, uh, when testing disease uh, agents with you know, uh, potential to modify the disease. Right. Um, and Dr. Weidman, we went into some specifics around um, what Donatamib is aiming towards, but tell us a little bit about the results so far um, as a principal investigator, what you're seeing um, and you know what, what does it look like? Yeah. So in terms of, there's no published data, only proprietary on this phase three I talked about that is a greater numbers. So I can only really uh, lend an opinion about what's already published. So both in the New England Journal of Medicine and the responses by Alzheimer's experts in various uh, 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 online uh, magazines, one is Alzheimer's Forum, that's my go-to. So in both the New England Journal uh, and uh, from March and then subsequent responses, Denanomab clearly, clearly has an interesting uh, mechanism in that it lowers the amyloid burden or the total amount and removes it, you know, gets it out of the brain and into the circulation promptly to almost normal levels, such that in this phase two trial, oh, about a third, uh, a quarter of the patients within six months had a lowering of the amyloid such that we didn't even know they could be switched to placebo because the drug already did its job. And then after about 12 months, about half of the folks had amyloid sufficiently removed. Now, of course, the caveat here is we don't know the duration of that lowering or removal uh, over the expected uh, duration of Alzheimer's disease. So that's a caveat, but, uh, and, Mind you, it'd be nice to see this replication in the phase three trial, but it certainly is something we need to think about in terms of feasibility and practicality that if this drug could be given at an early stage for only a year, and that is that, while we think about a cocktail or other things to do, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Sabah, likes to call it maybe induction therapy, uh, similar to uh, people with cancer who might get three or four agents, but the first one is induction to, uh, in other words, it uh, induces the immune system or the body's reaction such that the standard chemotherapy may be even more effective subsequently. Right. A lot of people also refer to it as a treatment, much like HIV, where it's a cocktail of approaches. Yeah, um, I, I think that will be the future. Um, and uh, you could do the math. There is just no known duration of uh, administration of monthly adjuhelm. Uh, I'm open-minded about prescribing it, but people opting in really need to understand that going forward. So we don't know how long to expose them or treat them with this yeah. newly- not, not to mention it's not that affordable to many people, right? I mean, it's an expensive drug. Yeah, I mean, the, the price uh, they quote is, uh, is it's going, it will have to be lowered. Yeah. Health economics and the macroeconomics of the situation are such that it will have to be lowered because that didn't even include the costs of uh, the nursing right. and administrative costs of prescribing, uh, yeah. getting these on the hospital formulary, getting insurance to pay for them. And then there's the hidden ancillary costs of, uh, we need to know if there's elevated amyloid in the brain. And right now, Medicare, and insurance right. companies don't pay for amyloid PET scans, uh, and many insurance companies don't cover the costs of even the uh, checking for the uh, markers of amyloid and tau in spinal fluid through a lumbar puncture or right. spinal tap, So, Okay, I want to get to another question, which is, um, does the plaque keep growing? Um, 
you know, presumably on the, the this on on these types of drugs. Um, and does it take away memories a little bit at, at a time? So is, if I'm understanding the questions, what she's asking is, does less plaque mean better memory? Um, if, you know, if you continually have this process of gro growing plaque, does that mean, you know, does that equate to memory? No, because the plaque is forming in early stages when there's no symptoms you know, at 10 years and sometimes even 15 or 20 years in genetic cases before symptoms begin. So uh, we are, if the amyloid hypothesis is correct at the early stages, lowering the amount of amyloid gets rid of some toxic species, which then what's called downstream kind of communicates with uh, nerve cells and inflama inflammatory cells in the brain called microglia to say, hey, stop, you know, producing uh, this much uh, tau, phosphorylated tau. So that's the connection. The phosphorylated tau accumulation is uh, what is much more closely associated with cognitive symptoms such as memory loss, short-term memory loss. Yeah. Dr. Weinman, why do uh, these drugs, why do they have to be infusions? Well, I actually, one of the anti-amyloid therapies uh, gantanarumab can be given subcutaneously and uh, in a shot. Uh, so that has promise for that convenience. But, but just to be clear, that drug is not yeah. as, far, as far down the pipeline as the nanumab, right? In, in terms I, of I, I don't know why that can be given subcutaneously and these cannot, aducanumab, which is aducanumab or adenanumab, but I do know that no monoclonal antibody could be given orally as a pill because it would it's a protein and your stomach of course would dissolve uh most of it before it gets into the bloodstream and uh because proteins are broken down in the stomach uh not even the small intestines and so um uh, cannot be given orally so um just to be clear um i was uh, we have another question about um why amyloid related imaging abnormality, uh, abnormalities um, occur when you take these drugs. So we've heard about, um, yeah. if I'm right, it's like little teeny bleeds or so, is that, yeah. is that right to say? And it's been, it's a side effect that happens with these type of drugs. Um, I've been told they're not at an alarming rate where you're in danger, but it is, it, it is a side effect. So tell us a little bit more about that yeah. and what we know about those. Right. Well, years ago, it was considered a side effect. Now it's an effect, and it's expected in a certain number of people uh, with uh, these type of antibodies. Uh, as you go up, especially at therapeutic doses, there can be upwards of 20 to 40% of people may have such a actually effective reaction where they're clearing out the amyloid into the blood vessels on the top of the brain, cortical blood vessels, such that that whole process <clears throat> makes that part of the brain a little leaky or more porous, depending on uh, where the amyloid is, is greatest in its, in its load or accumulation. And it can have two reactions. One is moving it out will lead to a little, little leakage of water, either on the surface of the brain or just underneath the surface of the brain, or the uh, that increased, uh, porous nature of the whole process can lead to little leaking of now this mobilized amyloid into vessels from the cortical blood vessels themselves. And they do penetrate the brain to give oxygen to the brain. Sometimes these blood vessels are inside the brain and these are called micro hemorrhages or micro bleeds, uh, little iron deposits. And the iron deposits tend to be uh, not, not productive of symptoms, the rate of the watery type, ARIA stands for amyloid related imaging abnormality, was uh, 6% with denanumab in terms of causing symptoms, headache, confusion, dizziness. But we've learned over the last 10 or 15 years how to very quickly monitor by holding the dose, letting the edema or water resolve. If there's too many microbleeds, that means the person may have also amyloid in their blood vessels to begin with. And then sometimes if we accumulate too many microblades, we're worried about a bigger hemorrhage and we just have to stop the drug permanently. 
uh, in those uh, uh, trial participants. Have have there been to date, as uh, if you're aware of any anyone who that's happened to, where it it actually caused um, a situation that was more serious? There was no macro macro hemorrhage in the denim of phase two. Uh, the uh, incidence of that was very low with aducanumab. Uh, there were a couple of persons with stroke-like symptoms in the phase two of denanumab. Uh, which uh, did reverse, and uh, but uh, there is uh, close monitoring that sometimes needs to be done, and a lot of education that if a person has a sudden garbled speech or can't speak or a numbness on one side, uh, within our trials, of course, it would just demand immediate attention from the family. Uh, but those who are actually been hospitalized, uh, which is under a handful, less than five. Uh, were uh, having had reversible neurologic deficits and they were not macro bleeds or large bleeds, knock, knock on wood. But it, you know, theoretically, this can be uh, a side effect of these drugs. Uh, and, and you can imagine when it's given to thousands that obviously we're amplifying uh, that, uh, that chance. So I know there was a little bit, there's always, we get questions all the time on being patient, uh, you know, who, I mean, a lot of people want to know more about trials and who qualifies, um, you know, and leaving geography out of it. I mean, I, I'm assuming they're going on in the U.S. I don't know if, if Lily has trial sites outside of the U.S., um, but who may, who's the perfect candidate? Is it much like um, who was in the aducanumab study? So early stage presence of plaque. Uh, tell us a little bit more about who would make an ideal candidate for this study. Yeah, so it, uh, actually this phase three with denanumab is, uh, has so many persons uh, being evaluated now uh, called the screening phase that by the end of this calendar month, uh, there will no longer be opportunity for some uh, mild Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment uh, due to Alzheimer's patients uh, to be enrolled. So they've reached their target numbers. Uh, but who is the ideal candidate? It is someone who, who has been the ideal candidate, is someone who uh, scores a certain, uh, above a certain amount on some tests, but then under a certain amount on a memory test or on a, um, uh, a test called clinical dementia rating scale and uh, in different trials. But I don't want to be too specific to denanumab, but again, there's that sweet spot. But the, the persons who would quali have qualified for these types of monoclonal antibody trials uh, lately is mild cognitive impairment. That means there's a struggle. People are doing things more slowly, inefficiently, have to compensate more either with technology, uh, but not quite just simply relying on their loved ones as the memory aid to analogize from a hearing aid. And they're still overall independent. And then we have a population of mild stage Alzheimer's patients who are just transitioning, who might need help with finances or might need help with uh, their calendar uh, or might need help with uh, medications, the most complex uh, activities of daily living. And those type, type of participants uh, also seem to actually more likely uh, score in, in the sweet spot for these trials. Sometimes we have people with mild cognitive impairment, but they do too well on our uh, entry tests. And it's a right. good, it's a good news, bad news. That's a good, a good, yeah. that would bad be news good. is you can't qualify. Good news is you're, I, I just found out you're at an earlier stage. Right. Taking care of you. Yeah. So can you put this into context for us? Because there's been a lot of controversy around Adjuhelm, um, you know, yeah. in the scientific community. We've had on being patient researchers who are fully supportive of this type of drug therapy moving forward um, and, and declaring it as a breakthrough. And we have as many people saying this should not be coming to market. This is not ready. We don't have the data and they don't support it. I mean, we, we've seen you know, two, two big hospital systems last week announced that they are not going to um, administer Adjuhelm. I mean, I, I understand that you are running what you're a principal investigator in the trial of Donanima, but give us a little bit of insight into how, I mean, you've obviously been in this space for a while. Um, you know, how, how do you look at it? Um, is it a breakthrough? Is it something we need 
you know, more, more data on, um, how are you seeing it? I'm seeing it as I can present as many facts as I can about what we know. First off, that uh, I wouldn't call it controversial. I would say the data is ambiguous simply because one of the larger phase three trials, they ran two exact same trials uh, in parallel, the exact same study. One met its primary endpoint of slowing down cognitive decline on a measurement. The other did not. So that's ambiguous. I'm not certain it's controversial because uh, on a number of measures, there was a signal of efficacy. But then I will also say uh, to uh, patients and their loved ones that uh, the caveat is this is group to group. On an individual basis, where you're not going to know or your loved one is not going to know during, say, the first 78 weeks to mimic the trial, which is about a year and a half, whether or not he or she is going to uh, feel any better on the drug, most likely not. And the concept of slowing down cognitive decline is difficult on an individual basis because uh, each person at that earlier stage kind of dictates his or her own pace of progression. They might have comorbidities, they might have vascular problems, hardening in the capillaries, it used to be called hardening in the arteries, which is kind of a, a misnomer. They may have, uh, after a certain age, after 80, uh, different things going on in their short-term memory banks called the hippocampus. And so all of these things, I could go on and on, but the point is, I just would put all the cards on the table and say, you know, your call. I think it's ultimately, we, we partner, it, you know, just give as much information as we can. I would certainly like to make sure that we can provide the same amount of monitoring as in the trials. That's the trickier part. Uh, can we do as many MRIs if someone says I have a headache just on one side or uh, there's a vague visual disturbance that clearly is evident to, to the loved ones? So there's, to me, the option of not prescribing it, uh, I'm, I'm open-minded and I'd be willing to prescribe it uh, the FDA saw a lot of different data, and uh, I don't want to get into the controversies of whether or not there was any bias in that. Uh, and I think I just read in the paper that the head of the FDA may be opening up to a third party to uh, look at the relationship between Biogen and the FDA in terms of uh, was all of the data presented. So that, that part's the kind of, but I'm going to stay out of that as a clinician and dementia specialist and uh, deal with what I know now. Uh, bigger hurdle again is will the insurance companies allow me to check for elevated amyloid and B, will they allow me to order so many uh, MRIs if I need to, uh, to really survey the brain and see if there's any uh, significant reaction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Sure. David Weidman of the Banner Alzheimer's Institute. Okay. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your insights. Okay. Um, I know within our community, there a lot of questions remain, but uh, people are interested. I mean, if this could take us a step forward, that's a great thing. Um, but, you know, it seems like there's still a lot of questions to answer. But so thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you. My pleasure. Hope you so, all got um, For more on these interviews, if you missed any of, a, um, of this one, please go to beingpatient.com. Don't forget get to sign up for our newsletter. We let you know about um, upcoming interviews such as this one, um, bringing the experts to you and also looking at people who have been diagnosed, getting their perspective um, as well. Thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye.